It's a fair exchange, fair exchange, fair exchange. Yo, yeah. know me as the guy with the game plan, shoot with the tie and the ray bait. Welcome to Crypto Download. In today's video, we're going to cover and share our thoughts on the SEC charging Block One, the parent company of EOS, for conducting an unregistered ICO, Telegram launching Ton in late October, the parent company of Sciacoin also getting into an agreement with the SEC and being fined, CoinExchange.io closing up shop because of financial issues, and Coinbase, Kraken, Polonix, and Bittrex coming together to join forces to rate cryptocurrencies and whether they're securities or not. Let's get into it. First up, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, has announced on Monday that it has settled charges against blockchain builder Block.1 for conducting an unregistered initial coin offering. The firm has agreed to pay $24 million penalty. Bill, I mean, what do you think about this? The SEC had a huge choice here, right? If they, you know, find them a billion dollars, they would have taken out the number seven cryptocurrency on the market cap chart, right? In other words, they could have wrecked the whole market with this. And, you know, believe it or not, regulators get knocked around, but I don't think regulators want to wreck a whole market. So this fine seems really low. They gave them a pass. And as, when I read the details, it looks like, you know, they're giving block one, not only a low fine, but continued slack to operate. And of course, conveniently, I also noticed that the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia gave them a $600,000 grant to build a giant headquarters. So at the end of the day, I just think the SEC didn't want to be heavy handed here because they didn't want to wipe the whole market out. But it feels like they just gave them a slap on the wrist. What's your take on this, Saurabh? Let's compare and contrast. So a few days ago, Blockstack raised around $23 million from general public. In doing that, Blockstack, they took all the approvals from the SEC for their public offering, wherein they spent about 10 months and $2 million for all the approvals, right? So $24 million for a $4 billion ICO, that's like 0.6%. And Blockstack, just to take approvals, they spent around 9% of the amount that they were going to raise. So now, on one hand, what Bill said, you don't want to wreck the entire market. But SEC is out there to set some precedent, right? So if I'm a project, I want to raise money. I would rather not go for any of the approvals and pay some fine later, which might be one or 2% of the amount that I raise, as opposed to spend my time, energy and money to get, the, get all the necessary approvals. So I don't think from setting precedents point of view, this is that good a news. Yeah, I think it's definitely a bad service to everybody who's trying to abide by the rules. <laughs> exactly. There's no incentive to abide by the rules based on the ROI, right? assuming companies and entrepreneurs are rational. Okay, next in the news, Telegram will launch its Telegram open network, TON, in late October. Investors are provided with the TON key generation software and will be required to provide Telegram with a public key to receive their GRAM, GRM tokens the platform's native token by October 16th. Sam, so your review on Telegram Ton just went live today, actually. So what's your take on this? So we know Telegram open network, if it doesn't go live by October 31st, they have to return all $1.7 billion that they raised back to investors. So we can definitely expect them to come out by with something by Halloween, October 31st. And in regards to this, I just used that key generation software they created. It's pretty cool. You basically just button mash on your computer 200 times and the software generates like a bunch of words that are your private key. And then I guess for every investor watching this that invested in Telegram, you guys have to get your public key to Telegram by October 16th in order to receive the Telegram gram tokens. And then I'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons of Telegram. So pros are the 180 million users that they have on the platform. And if they all get a wallet, a Telegram wallet, it will immediately make it the most adopted cryptocurrency. Also, Paul Bell uh, Durov was the guy that created it. He also created VK. 
and he's a very successful entrepreneur. He founded Telegram and created this Telegram Ton uh, blockchain. The grand plan is to handle millions of transactions per second and accommodate millions of users and thousands of dApps. And the project's been getting tons of media attention. And then a couple of cons are people think that it might be a money grab just to fund Telegram's development because Telegram's all self-funded by Paul Valderov up until now. And then also another big con that I saw was blockchain trilemma, which is talked about all the time by Vitalik uh, and many other people is security, scalability, and decentralization. If Telegram Ton's trying to accomplish millions of TPS, then they should definitely talk in the white paper about security and threats that could come up. And the word security only appeared once in the whole white paper and the word threat, not at all. So I thought that that was definitely weird. What was your thought about it, Ian? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very hard to analyze Telegram Ton, right? Because we yeah. know how, how good of an entrepreneur Pavel Durov is. Right. We, all, we all use Telegram. Most people in, in the crypto community use Telegram every single day. Right? To me, it's, it's the number one app on my phone. Right? I wake up opening Telegram. I go to sleep with Telegram on. Right? I'm basically married to Telegram. <laughs> so the fact that they're launching a cryptocurrency is huge. And if, as, as you mentioned, if 180 million people have access to this, this can really take crypto mainstream. So Telegram and Facebook at the forefront of the crypto revolution is very interesting because they're both the exact opposite, right? Telegram does not sell or store any data, right? While Facebook does, right? Facebook is known for doing that. Although the cryptocurrency won't do that, but they have that reputation of selling out to the, the ad buyers and the ad advertisers. So with Telegram, the technology looks good, but the team is anonymous, right? But based on the analysis we put out this week, right? The team is anonymous. You don't know who the developers are, which is good for that privacy and secrecy. But I think it can draw lots of attention when it comes to regulation, right? It's kind of like Bitcoin, right? When we, we don't know who the developers are, all we have is just GitHub and code, right? Then when the network launches, the investors will be choosing the validators on, on the node. I think the community might, might have some pushback on that, right? They'll, they'll say, why do all the rich guys have to choose who the validators are, right? This, is, this isn't really decentralized. It's just a rich who put in 1.7 billion who are choosing the validators. So I think there'll be some pushback on that. But overall, I'm definitely intrigued to see how they debut. All right, next up, Nebulous Inc., the firm behind the SciaCoin decentralized cloud storage network has entered a settlement agreement with the SEC. According to an SEC filing in 2014 and 2015, Nebulous offered and sold securities that were required to be registered with the commission. Sam, so you, you, you're based in Boston where the company is actually based, right? And you, you've had a chance to meet the team. What's your take on this? Yeah, so, I mean, the SEC is really getting involved now. Uh, interesting news for me, definitely, because I met CEO David Vorick a few months ago at an MIT Bitcoin conference. So it's really strange to see him in the news. He's a really cool guy. He's smart. We talked about world events. We talked about the work that he's doing in, did in Africa a couple of years ago. And then we got to talk about chess a little bit and you know how much I love chess. So after the Bitcoin conference, David invited me to his house for pizza, chess, and super smash. Classic, <laughs> classic crypto. I crushed him in a game of speed chess. Now I know that game probably wasn't so fair because he was in his head thinking about the SEC and deeming the cryptocurrency that he created his baby a security. And then he was also working on a settlement with the SEC at that time, I guess. So he has to pay 225000 but I guess that's really not that much money. So what, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, compared to EOS, the n number amount is not much, but I think based on how much they raised, because they only raised $1.5 in yeah. the offering they had, I believe, the Reg D last year, right? So they, they don't have a billion dollars. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's definitely a larger chunk of their, of their income, all right, of their, of their funds. I think it's very interesting, right? Because the SEC is fining them or penalizing them for something that happened several years before, right? Three months before the Ethereum offering. That's how early they were, right? This team was early. This was done on Bitcoin Talk Forum, which is not really, I mean, it's still there, but nowadays everybody's on Telegram, 
nice. And this is before Telegram days. They had their offering on a, on a public forum, raised funds that way before there was any guidance from the SEC. So I think it's definitely upsetting to them, right? That the SEC is coming for them after the, after so long, right? Because ever since then, all the future offerings they've had, they've abided by the rules and, and laws in the, in the States. So I think it's tough on the company, but I think they'll survive, right? They haven't really admitted any guilt. They've just kind of paid the fine and moved on, right? Uh, the SEC hasn't found any issue with Sirecoin itself, right? Which is good, right? So I think that definitely is something that can possibly grow in the future, right? I, I was an early investor in Sirecoin. Actually, I think I had a 10X way back in 2017 on Sirecoin. But then I sold it after they got into the hardware business with the Obelisk ASIC mining platform or device because I didn't really think they had any business being in the in the hardware space, right? And then I also got out of it for Filecoin because I was an investor in Filecoin, uh, the builders of IPFS, which I think is going to be a much more widely used technology for decentralized storage, right? Because it's already being used by the development community a lot. So I think that made their entire industry more competitive, but I think they definitely do have a chance because they've been around a while and they're backed by big companies like Dane Venture. All right, next up, altcoin trading platform CoinExchange.io has announced that it is shutting down due to financial difficulties. In an official announcement, the platform noted that the closure was purely a business decision and is not connected to any security breach or another incident. I mean, so several exchanges are, have been getting hacked or getting shut down. This is actually a pretty big exchange. Uh, Traffic-wise, they get almost a million visits a month, right? So this is definitely not some small exchange, although it's nowhere like Binance. Binance gets about 20 million visits a month, right? So in comparison, it's, it's not Binance, but it still does get a large portion of the world, right? They have users from mainly in Tur Turkey, Russia, and America, and Brazil, right? So I think those users would now have to find some other plat platform to go to. And I think people really gravitated to, to, a, to an exchange like this because it's known as kind of the altcoin exchange, right? It's an exchange people use when, when they're basically looking for altcoins. I, people kind of call this altcoin gambling, right? Because these are the low tier altcoins that have no business being on Binance and they'll never, never be on Binance, right? It's kind of like playing Russian roulette, right? So for somebody who wants to kind of gamble with crypto money, right? They just go on platforms like this. So it's very interesting that they're closing shop, right? Because I think the bear market has been uh, very prolonged. I, I guess maybe Bill can kind of add to this, right? Uh, to a point now, businesses are, sh are closing down. Because I know early in the year when I spoke with some other exchanges, lots of exchanges were closing. And I think Shapeshift also laid off 40% of their staff, right, early in the year. So the longer we go without really seeing a real full-on bull market, the tougher it becomes for companies to survive. I, I think it's good when I call it the crypto casino. It, you know, this really was a casino, but crypto has to go from being, and will go from being a casino to a real investment product. And while it's unfortunate that people lose money in coins or lose their jobs at exchanges, and I've been through downturns at Wall Street, so I get it. But the faster we get the excess out of the system and the punters and the gamblers and get this into the realm of the investors, the better off it'll be for the whole crypto system. All right. Thank you, Bill. Next up, Crypto Rating Council has been formed. So cryptocurrency exchanges Coinbase, Kraken, Poloniex, and Bittrex have developed a system to rate which cryptocurrencies are likely to be securities. The newly formed Crypto Ratings Council will publish online ratings of cryptocurrencies on a scale of one to five, with five being these currencies are securities. Wow, so this is very interesting, right? As Tokenmetrics, right? The, the company that also, also rates cryptocurrencies, we're very intrigued by this. So, so Rob, what's your take on this? I was curious to know how their framework looks like. I mean, what kind of analysis do they do to find out whether any cryptocurrency possesses security-like characteristics or not? So they mentioned the Howey, uh, Howey test where there are four primary components. First is whether it's an investment of money. Second is whether it's a common enterprise. Third is whether there is any expectation of profit. And fourth is whether it is solely from the effort of others. 
Now, what the framework says is that they have designed a bunch of questions below these four subcategories. These are yes or no questions. They try to answer these questions and arrive at a final rating out of five. And I mean, based on current published ratings, Maker, Polybath, and Ripple. I mean, we all know that. I mean, I thought that Ripple should get a straight up five. I don't know. But Maker and Polymath, they have got around 4.5, which is like, they are almost a security according to this concept. It's like self-regulation, right? I mean, the industry itself, because we don't know how to regulate these things, some of the leaders in the industry, they themselves are coming together and trying to form certain guidelines as to, and how, I mean, based on this, people can design how their cryptocurrencies could look like. I think Bill has a lot of experience because financial markets move a lot when regulators try to do anything. So maybe he can weigh in on this. All right. Yes, I'd be happy to. So whether or not a cryptocurrency is a security or not, speaking of the casino, uh, it's up to the SEC. It's like the bouncing ball on the roulette wheel. So while we appreciate exchanges trying to give people more clarity as they try to learn about this, uh, the ultimate arbiter is whatever the government says, whenever they want to say it, however they want to say it. All right. So right now we know the only thing that's not a security is Bitcoin and Ethereum because they pretty much said that. Yeah. Uh, I noticed they gave Monero a one, uh, you know, Monero is a, probably a, a security and not a currency, but that doesn't mean governments don't like it, right? So it's a cryptocurrency rating. It's informative, but I would not look at it as a government likability index because they can like whatever they want, whenever they want. Back to you. Thank you, Bill. That concludes this week's show. Hope you guys like it. Now let us know in the comments down below whether what you think the SEC is doing is good or not, right? Do you think SEC regulating hard the last few months and passing out judgments to all these different companies is good, right? If you, if you think yes, just say yes in the comments down below. If you think no, then, then say hell no in the comments down below, right? And be sure to subscribe and like the video and just tell us if you like the content, right? Until next time, to the moon and beyond. Steve and Dave use eToro to invest in the financial markets. Steve does research on global investment opportunities. Dave does research on how to become a level 60 wizard. Steve follows the feed for the latest market news. Dave follows the feed for the latest cat videos. Steve has a watch list for promising investments. Dave has a watch list too. So why is Dave just as good an investor as Steve? It's because Dave used eToro's copy trader to automatically replicate Steve's trading activity. Whenever Steve makes a trade, Dave does too. Yes. Trade like a Steve with eToro, the world's leading social trading platform. Yo, you know me as the guy with the gameplay. Shoot with the tie and the raid.